First of all, let me thank Yannick for his kind invitation. I also thank my collaborator, Enno Lensman, which turns out to be uh, the second organizer of this nice meeting. And uh, I would like to address my apologies to many people first. First of all, of course, to Atem and, and to Jean-Claude and other people who were in Bonn who also listened to this talk uh, three weeks ago. Uh, but the, my most abject apologies are addressed to the heat lovers, because unfortunately I will not talk about the heat equation. <laughs> so no mother in my talk, but in fact probably a grandmother and a daughter. Uh, indeed, uh, I'm going to talk about the wave equation. And uh, according to what I know about the history of partial differential equations, the wave equation was the first to be discovered by Jean Laurent d'Alembert in, in the 18th century. Okay, but it turns out that this wave equation is also, can also be seen as a daughter of, uh, of many PDEs because it belongs to the family of Hamiltonian PDEs, which uh, in particular inspired very much the mathematical formalism for quantum mechanics. So I'm going to talk about some special wave equation, which turns out to be half wave, and we'll see what it is. And in fact, what I'm going to do is to try to, uh, to study some special long time regime, which is in fact very close to what uh, Manuel Del Pino and, and Totti Daskalopoulos thought about, uh, about in, in the case of uh, heat equations and geometric flows, which is bubbling, okay? So bubbling is also a very, very uh, powerful method in uh, the, the theory of Hamiltonian equation, in particular wave equations. And, and this bubbling will be particularly interesting because it allows to, I mean, make some, some first approach to what people call sometimes uh, wave turbulence, okay. So, uh, of course, I have to, to explain more about that, but first of all, let me uh, tell you that my, my authors, my team, my team is, based, is made with Enno Lensman, so again, organizer of this conference, uh, Oana Pokovniku, who is in uh, Edinburgh, And, uh, and uh, an expert of uh, collaboration in elevators called Pierre Raphael <laughs> in this. <laughs> okay, so it's always a pleasure to collaborate with all these people. Um, so, So this equation is a very simple one-dimensional equation. So x is in R, in our case. It could be also in the torus, but the, the situations are slightly different, and, uh, and, uh, and the problem I'm going to talk about is not that easy to, to, to generalize to this case. So it's a Hamiltonian PDE, so the function u is a function of t in x, so t is in R too. And, uh, and the equation looks like this. I du dt equals mod du minus mod u square u, plus or minus for the moment. So uh, mod d is uh, the, the classical half, uh, half Laplacian. So it's square root of, of minus dx square. So if you, if you are given a xi function, a xi You have this, and this is really, uh, from the point of view, we could sh think of it as a fractional, fractional uh, Schrodinger equation, okay? Replacing uh, dx squared by its, the square root of minus dx squared, okay? So. 
So this equation was also already introduced during this conference by, in the talk of uh, Toru Ozawa. Uh, so I'm not interested in the uh, question of, uh, of uh, well posedness for, for this uh, equation. So uh, Toru told you about this uh, in his talk. I, I will just remind you what it is. But I'm really interested in long time behavior of solutions. So uh, why, why looking at that kind of equation? So this question of long time behavior of solutions, in particular the appearance of small scales, which is one of the features of what physicists sometimes call wave turbulence or weak turbulence, is a, is a very important uh, question. And uh, in fact, it was uh, addressed uh, some, some time ago in 1997 by uh, Maida McLaughlin and Tabak in some, some paper with uh, many uh, numerical computations. And this paper was devoted to, uh, more generally, this fractional Schrodinger equation, okay. uh, which, in fact, uh, was supposed to be a, a one-dimensional approach to wave turbulence. So what these people uh, observed is that, and a very, I mean, a very uh, classical fact, is that if you look at the, the case alpha equals two, you have the, the so-called nonlinear Schrodinger equation, and in the cubic nonlinear Schrodinger equation in 1D turns out to be an integrable equation. So this is a very nice theorem by Zakharov and Shabbat in, uh, in the early 70s. And, uh, and as a consequence, well, in fact, you can expand the conservation laws of this. And you can prove that the conservation laws control the whole regularity of the solution. So if you start from a solution which is in HP for big P, then, of course, the solution st stays HP, but uniformly in time, which means that the HP norm turns out to be globally bounded in time, which is highly non-trivial, and which is, in some sense, uh, in the opposite of what we call wave turbulence, because wave turbulence would mean that you have long-term transition to high frequencies, and that would mean that some, some Sobolev norm high Sobolev form would be big in some sense. So for, for, for showing this, we, we, are, we are dealing with this dispersion relation, according to, to the vocabulary already used by Walter in his talk on, on, on Monday. And the dispersion relation here is the function xi to the alpha. And for alpha smaller than two, well, you can, of course, look at uh, what are called resonances. Uh, again, according to the vocabulary used by, uh, by Walter, so resonances, resonance is quoted, not triad, but quoted here because it's a cubic nonlinearity. Uh, looks like this. So this is again the kind of equation you obtain when you write a global equation on the Fourier transforms, and, uh, and you, uh, you uh, filter this by the linear evolution, and then you will see some oscillating terms. And these, these, ter these quantities correspond to non-oscillating terms, by the way, okay? So we're completely resonant. Well, it turns out that for alpha bigger than one, because of some convexity property, such resonances essentially do not exist, except the trivial case where, where C1 equals C2 and C3 equals C4 or something, something like this, okay? But a, apart from the trivial resonances, which always exist, all the others do not exist if alpha is bigger than two. Bigger than one, sorry. No resonance. No non-trivial. But for alpha smaller than one, you can find there exist. And for alpha equals one, there exists a lot, a lot of resonances. And you can see it very easily because this system on C1, C2, C3, C4 in, in, in the real line is a very simple system. It looks like this. Let me write it that way in 
slightly different way. And this just says that, apart from the non-trivial ones, uh, uh, the trivial ones, uh, uh, this just says that the CJs have the same sign. So if you take the CJs with the same sign, you can write, in fact, in that case, you write the same equation. <laughs> okay? It's trivial. Okay? So this case for alpha equals 1, which is precisely the case we are in interested in, is, is an equation where we have lots of resonances. And so, in some sense, this should favor the transition to high frequencies. Because the Birkhoff normal form, according to the vocabulary used by Walter, the Birkhoff normal form will be still a very rich operator. And it turns out that the Birkhoff normal form for this equation is a very interesting equation because it is integrable. It enjoys a lax pair. So the Birkhoff normal form, we will talk about it more precisely during the talk. I mean, the, at least the formal one enjoys a lax pair structure. This is the so-called Seeger equation. Okay, I will, I will tell you more about that. But uh, there is, in fact, another reason why, to, uh, why looking at, at this equation. And the other reason is connected to another talk on Monday, which was the talk by Hajer Bauri. So remember that Hajer Bauri was talking about uh, nonlinear Schrodinger equations or nonlinear wave equations on uh, two step Nilpotan groups, and on, uh, particularly on, on the, the Eisenberg group. And if you look at the Eisenberg group and the nonlinear Schrodinger equation on the Eisenberg group, it turns out that you, you don't have any kind of dispersion. We observed this in a, talk, in a, in a paper in collaboration with, uh, with uh, Xiaosheng Xu uh, 15 years ago. Uh, and in fact, the reason why you have no dispersion for the nonlinear Schrodinger equation for the Heisenberg group is that the, Sch the Schrodinger evolution, the linear Schrodinger evolution, looks like just a transport evolution, I mean, a, a system, a completely decoupled system of transport equations uh, with, uh, with uh, essentially uh, con constant velocity. So it's an infinite system and transport equations. So, of course, transport equations do not disperse. And uh, the t it turns out that uh, if you now introduce some cubic term here, uh, then you have a, a coupled system of transport equations, and, and they are coupled by, by projectors acting on u square u. So that's exactly what happens in this case in a very in a much simpler situation. So you can, of course, write another formulation of this equation. is as follows. So you introduce the following Seeger projectors, pi plus and pi minus, which again are defined in Fourier just by introducing the characteristic function for xi positive and xi negative. So I just take the Fourier transform of f, I just discard all the negative Fourier mode, and here I discard all the positive ones. Um, remember, I'm on, on R, okay? Okay. Though these are bounded operator on L2, and in fact on LP for P between 1 and, and infinity, it's a, it's a classical theorem of Marcel Ries. And, uh, and uh, these operators can be used for writing slightly differently HW plus or minus. If I, I write U plus or minus equals pi plus or minus u, I have the following system of transport equation, which looks like this. I ddt plus ddx u plus equals pi plus of mod u square u, and I ddt minus ddx u minus equals pi minus of mod u square u, and u is u plus plus u minus. So you have a very nice 
system of transport equations which shows you that the group velocities here are just one and minus one, so no dispersion, but, but you have something which is coupled nonlinearly by, uh, by that term, that local nonlinear term, combined with these non-local terms. Okay? And this is a new thing. Okay? So this, this feature in fact, introduced some, some, uh, some, new, some new specificity of this equation, and that's what I would like to tell you about. Okay, so, uh, enough for, for this introduction. Let me tell you about conservation laws and uh, well poisonous and also scaling. So the conservation laws are very classical. As, as for any kind of nonlinear Schrodinger equation, you have uh, the energy, which is the Hamiltonian, which you can write that way, plus or minus one fourth. Fourth, fourth this is uh, the L2 inner product. You can define, of course, the L2 norm which is also a conservation law due to the fact that you have a group of symmetries which is just a gauge group multiplication by complex numbers of modulus one. And this gauge group is a group of symmetries, so by Neuter theorem, this gives you a conservation law, which is this one. And you have also, we also have a very nice group of symmetries, which is translations. And, and by Neuter theorem, you get the so-called momentum. is this. So again, d is 1 over i d dx, which corresponds to multiplication by xc in Fourier side. Okay? So what is very specific to this equation, again, is that these two equations, these two conservation laws, the first one and the third one, the energy and the momentum, they scale essentially the same. Because, well, uh, this term is in general uh, of, of low order, but in the scaling, these two terms are very close to each other. Except that this one is positive, this one is not. Okay? But you can combine them, and, and the fact that we can combine them will be a very important, uh, 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 will be a, a very important element in, in the analysis of what, what we are going to do. Okay, so this is about conservation laws. What about scaling? Well, the scaling is extremely standard. Uh, so uh, if you are given a positive number lambda, and if u is a solution to your equation hw plus or minus, then this quantity is also a solution. Okay? And uh, finally, we have some global well posner uh, theorem, which was proved by myself and Sandrine Grelier in 2012 for the focusing case and, uh, and on, the, on the torus, but the, the proof is essentially the same, and which was proved particularly for, for the non, for the focusing case by Krieger, Lenzmann, and Raphael in 2013. And it tells you something like this. Uh, so uh, you have global well posedness on HS of R for S at least one half. If in the defocusing case, so defocusing case means plus, plus sign in the equation, so for HW plus, and for HW minus, you, have, you only have global well posedness, assuming, you see that this scale, with, like the L2 norm, so assuming a small L2 norm, a small, a small enough L2 norm, you have global well posed nerve. So the so small enough L2 norm corresponds to the L2 norm of some ground state. So ground, Q0 is a ground state. And this is, in fact, a minimizer of, uh, of the following uh, uh, of the following problem, which is the uh, gagliardo nirenberg inequality. So if you look at uh, duu times ul2 square divided by u in l4 to the 4, 
for u different from zero, it's easy, I mean, that's really classical analysis, to prove that, uh, well, this is first. I mean, the fact that this infimum is positive is, is due to the Sobolev inequality and gagliardo nirenberg inequality. And then if you, uh, you, can, you can prove that there are optimizers uh, just by concentration, compactness, or whatever, and, uh, and then you've... You, in fact, it's, it's possible to prove there is only one optimizer which is uh, uh, even and which is uh, positive. And this is, uh, this is a very nice result, far from being trivial. This is a solution of this, for instance. And, uh, and this is a very nice result by uh, Frank and Lenzmann, also at, at essentially at the same time. Okay. Okay, so this, this is a, what's called the ground state. So this is a very parallel theory so far with the nonlinear Schrodinger, the L2 critical nonlinear Schrodinger made, for instance, by Michael Weinstein uh, 34, 30 years ago. Okay, so, uh, so this, is, uh, this is the theory. So what I'm going to, to look at, in fact, is, is the, the second case, because the second case has more. Uh, more accessible nonlinear objects. So not what I call nonlinear objects are objects which like, like Q0, like traveling waves, etc. So the focusing case allow you to find much more nonlinear objects. And, and uh, in fact, uh, I'm going to look at many nonlinear objects for which the L2 norm is smaller than the L2 norm of Q0, so we'll have global existence. And I'm going essentially to work in this ball. Okay? So, uh, sorry. Now, let me tell you about uh, the family of solitons I'm interested in. For H, W minus, which is a half wave equation defocusing with a minus sign. And for these guys, OK, uh, I've already, of course, the following solution, which is a standing wave, clearly, due to, to, this, uh, to, this, uh, e uh, to this equation. But in fact, we can change a little bit, and we, f we can find traveling waves with a non-zero traveling with a non-zero velocity. And this can be done also by that kind of Gagliardo-Nirenberg inequality by playing on the fact that the energy, well, essentially the h half norm, and the momentum m of u, which I define here, they have the same scaling. Okay? So if I'm given some real number beta between minus 1 and, uh, and 1, I can consider, of course, the following infimum. This infimum is well defined as well because because this term also controls the h or half, the h or half, it's controlled up to some constant depending on beta, of course. It controls du u. It does not change very much. So it just, just, it's just a, a, a matter of constant. So for a given beta, this quantity is, of course, the same with a constant depending on beta, of course, as du u. Okay? So I can look at this, and by the same techniques of concentration compactness, I can find solutions which are, which are in fact, correspond to minimizing this guy. So uh, there exists some, some solution for that. Uh, and, uh, and in fact, by rescaling correctly these solutions and using writing the Euler-Lagrange equation for this problem, I have solution to this. So here, this is focusing again. Eh? That's why you have a plus here. If you put it on the other way, on the other side, it would be the minus of the of the original equation. Uh, 
Okay, so I can find solution of that for q beta, of course, not zero, for every beta different by one, uh, minus one and one. So this corresponds to solutions of the of my equation, which looks like this. So these are traveling waves, like this. Okay. So uh, why did I put one minus beta here? Okay. Because, in fact, the q beta, I'm, I'm in fact interested in what happens as beta goes to 1, or minus 1, let's say 1. So you see, from the physical point of view, I have a wave equation, and the speed of light is 1 for this wave equation. Okay? So here I found phenomena which propagate at a speed which is smaller than 1, some kind of particles, okay? And then I want to make this speed going to one, which means I like to find some photons, okay? <laughs> and uh, so what are the photonic solutions? What are the photonic limits of this? In fact, it's very interesting to see what happens if beta goes to one here. If you decompose Q beta using the Seeger projectors pi plus and pi minus, you will see that this operator on positive or negative frequencies will have a very different behavior. On positive frequencies, it's just D, very nice. On negative frequencies, it's one plus beta divided by one minus beta mod D, okay? But this means that the negative frequencies are strongly penalized by the convergence beta going to one. And it turns out that as beta going to one, we can prove that up to some rescaling, This converge as beta going to 1, and this converge very strongly, in fact, uh, in HS for all s, to some function q of x, which is a solution of this equation where you put formally beta equals 1, and you, you look only on the positive part. So pi plus q will be q, and dq plus q equals pi plus of q squared q. So this corresponds to some extent to the solution of the first, the first equation in the system, except that here, pi plus q equals q, okay? So, uh, so in that case, you can see that this, in fact, this equation, this function, while well, it was studied completely by Oana Pokovniku in her thesis, and it turns out that up to translation, and multiplication by complex number of Mölderus 1, q of x is completely understood. It's 1 over x plus i over 2. Just this, okay? So it's a very nice theorem that they, she published in analysis in PDEs. And in fact, this corresponds again to, to some minimizing problem, which is the infimum for pi plus u equals u of du u ul2 squared divided by ul44, again, a Gagliardoni and Berry inequality, but only on the hardest space, on the space with positive frequencies. And in fact, this guy is perfectly computed, which is pi, okay? So, uh, so this means that this guy, this E of it, uh, I think it's Q of x minus, uh, it's E, uh, e, e to the it uh, q of x, or maybe u, q of x minus t, I don't remember, whatever. This is a solution to this equation, i dtu equals du minus pi plus of u square u, okay? So this is the so-called Seger equation. And for this e Seger equation, in fact, we have very nice properties. In particular, we have some integrability. So this is a theorem we proved with Sandrine Grelier in 2010, and on the, on the circle, and on the, on the line, which is precisely what, what we did, it's also a theorem by Anna Pokovniku. It was really the starting point of her thesis. So, uh, so now, what is the point? The point is now we are going to try to understand to understand some the bifurcation which is here. So it turns out that we can make a very nice Lyapunov-Schmidt analysis and prove 
the following theorem, which I proved with my three collaborators. Uh, and this first theorem tells you that there exists a curve, a smooth curve, beta q beta, for beta close to 1, but smaller than 1, uh, valued in nature half. In fact, it's in all the, inch, all the HS. They are very smooth functions, such that uh, q beta is a soliton, so it's a solution of star here, and such that q beta tends to q as beta tends to 1, up to, you know, to applying these things, you can really take this q beta. So you can deform this q, which is perfectly well defined, and, and you get q betas, which are traveling waves of your half-wave equations. Moreover, I mean, these q beta are not explicit, of course, but at least we have some, some nice some nice description as x goes to infinity. And this description is the following. So you have a two-scale description because x goes to infinity, but beta, of course, is very close to 1. Okay? And you will see that, in fact, q beta of x is something like this, 1 over x, f of minus 1 minus beta, 1 plus beta x, plus o of x x squared times log x. And, and this f function is a special function. It's a special function. Let me write it down here. f of tau is a very explicit special function. It's the integral from 0 to infinity of alpha e to the minus alpha divided by alpha minus i tau, d alpha. Okay, so it's a nice function which decays at infinity like 1 over tau, and which at 0 is 1. Okay, so you have a nice function. It's a complex function, of course. And what is nice is here, you know, imagine that x goes to infinity and beta goes to 1. Then 1 minus beta x, well, does not know what to do, okay? <laughs> and, the, and so you have a two-scale analysis here. x is big, but 1 minus beta x may be very small or very big or just intermediate. And this will be a key observation in our analysis. And this analysis will be, in fact, very different from uh, the cubic Zegger equation, at least for a part. Okay, so what, what are we going to do with this? Uh, we are going to to make these two guys interacting. So the idea is to make interacting these two solitons, okay, with different betas, and by what is called the modulation theory, okay? So for, for just as a warm-up, which is more than a warm-up, in fact, but for, again, Oana Pokovniku's thesis was extremely useful in that direction. As a warm-up, we are going to look at the Seger equation, because this Seger equation, this one, is in some sense a photonic limit, a limit as beta goes to 1 of our equation. And in fact, in that case, we have some integrabilities. We can make very explicit computations. And now comes a miracle. Now comes a miracle. So, So this two soliton interaction for the cubic Zegger equation is as follows. So you start from, uh, from u0 of x, which is something like this, alpha 1 q of x minus x1 divided by kappa 1 plus alpha 2 q of x minus x2 divided by kappa 2. And kappa 1 and kappa 2 are positive numbers, and alpha 1, alpha 2 are uh, complex numbers, x1, x2 are real numbers, okay? You start from this, and you solve this equation. This equation is globally uh, well posed, no problem of uh, blow up for, for the cubic segu. Okay? For this equation, there is a wonderful miracle, which is that the solution for all time has exactly the same the same form where you put t everywhere. 
Or you'll see, okay, that's nice, that's modulation theory. No, 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 you didn't. You misunderstood me with no remainder term. <laughs> exact two soliton equation. This is, of course, a miracle due to integrability. Okay? But now, you can, of course, you can plug this expression into this. This is an exercise. As, as, soon, as, you, as soon as you dare doing that, just do it. Okay? You, pl you plug this into the equation, and you, and you obtain a very nice ODE system in alpha 1, alpha 2, x1, x2, kappa 1, kappa 2. You can solve this ODE system. And you can see something very interesting. Under some, under some special condition on the data, you will see that we have some transition to high frequencies, which corresponds to the case where at least one of the scaling coefficients, kappa 1t or kappa 2t, is going to go to zero as t goes to infinity, which is a bubble, exactly as in, in the talk by Manuel Del Pino, a bubble with, with a scaling parameter going to zero. And it will go to zero algebraically, as, as in the case of Manuel's talk. Uh, so let me state the theorem by Oana. The theorem by Oana tells you that Assume we have the following condition. This is an invariant condition on our, on our uh, coefficients. And this is alpha 1 divided by x1 minus x2 minus i kappa 1 plus kappa 2 over 2 equals alpha 2 divided by x1 minus x2 plus i kappa 1 plus kappa 2 over 2. OK? So assume I have this. You can check that this condition, if it satisfies at t equals 0, it satisfies for all time for the solution of the ODE first. And second, then, the minimum on j equals 1, 2 of kappa j t goes to 0 as t to the minus 2 as t goes to infinity. What does that mean? It means that in this case, and, and the other one, it goes to a constant, okay? No problem. So what does that mean? It means that one of the two guys is going to constraint. So this means that if you look at the Fourier transform, it will be supported by very high sets of, of, uh, of, of, uh, of, uh, of C variables, okay? So this is really a transition to high frequencies. And in particular, if you want to compute the HS norm of U, for s bigger than a half, of course, for s equals a half, the h a half norm is essentially a constant, so no problem. But for s bigger than a half, this is like t to the 2s minus 1. So it goes to infinity. Yes. But maybe with a different kappa j, with a different j. Okay? You may have some exchange between the two solitons. OK? All right. So this is the theorem of Wana. And when we saw this theorem, with Pierre in particular, we said, OK, we should be able to do the same thing on the half-wave equation by, by, in some sense, by modifying, perturbing everything due to this theorem and doing the same thing with the Q beta. And that's what we tried to do. OK? So. Uh, But of course, it's a little less easy. <laughs> so uh, the problem is the okay now to mimic or to transport to some extent this dynamics on the half wave equation through the q betas. It's very natural, okay? At least I, I, I made it natural, <laughs> okay? <laughs> so, uh, so, so what, okay, so, so, so the strategy is very classical. I mean, of course you are going to look for a solution of that kind, 
But then you will need a remainder term, of course, <laughs> and you will have, you'll need very, very thin energy estimates. But even constructing the approximate solution is a very difficult point, and I will tell you why. So let me write this in a very, in a slightly different way. So we will have a sum from j equals 1 to 2 of, a, of some object of this kind. So everything is, is depending on time, including beta j, of course. So you are making modulation theory, including on the parameter beta. And in fact, what we bet is that at least some of the beta will be closer and closer to one, so that we are closer and closer to the Seeger regime and to these things. Okay, so can we do that? Okay, plus some remainder term. Okay. Okay. So, uh, so if you do that, in fact, you have the following theorem. And this is my main theorem. It tells you that there exists, in fact, a solution in some special. Okay, so you need to introduce some parameter. So I'm going to do this starting from some time t equals t initial will be very which will be very very large okay so of course then you can translate everything if you like but but uh, i will write it down like uh, one over eta so eta will be a small parameter here positive parameter and uh, everything will be quantified in terms of this small parameter okay so i'm going to find for instance a, a small uh, a time which is almost 1 over eta, e, delta is a small parameter smaller than 1, and I'll have a, another parameter, delta 0, which is even smaller than delta, whatever, it's a little technical, sorry about that, but I'm interested in this time, t plus, which is more than 1 over eta, so I'm starting from a time which is a little less than over 1 over eta, and, which, and I, I want to go to a time which is a little more than one. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Manuel. Of course, this is a scaling, okay? Thank you all that. But what is important here is that, okay, the only time, the only time dependence is through parameters. So that's exactly what Hatem said in his talk. You know, you essentially, you, uh, this idea of modulation theory is to restrict yourself to some finite dimensional ODE. Okay, so can you do that? Okay, so the theorem is, yes, we can do it. Uh, yes, we can. And, and so uh, uh, what do we obtain? We obtain that, uh, we obtain, or maybe I should write it down here. We obtain that there exists such a solution for eta small enough, and moreover, there exists there exists parameters a and b. So essentially, you can find a solution with a small remainder term, so epsilon of t. So we, we just took the h1 norm as a, remain, uh, as a norm which is bigger than h half, but we could do further, except that it's more and more painful. Uh, so essentially, this will be like one, eta to the one fourth, whatever. And, and, uh, and uh, lambda of t, lambda two of t are essentially not, not moving, okay? What is moving are the beta. So the first beta, beta one, does not move. It's uh, around eta. But the second eta, the second beta is moving a lot. So this is at t initial, it's like eta to the one plus a. And for t bigger than t plus, which is this t plus here, for big t, then one minus beta essentially does not move anymore. And it's one plus b, where a 
is smaller than B. So there exist A and Bs, positives, and they depend on the delta and delta zero, whatever, such that we have this. Okay? So what does that mean? It's, uh, sorry, it's a little bit technical. What does that mean? It means that this Q beta 2, well, the Q beta 1 essentially does not, does not change. But the Q beta 2 will have some concentration effect during the time. And moreover, this concentration effect will persist for all time, but it will not go to zero. You won't have something which goes to infinity. After some time, there is some kind of saturation. Okay? And, and so you have, uh, if you look at the HS norms, for instance, if you look at the H1 norm, the H1 norm of your solution here is like, uh, uh, let me see, it's, a, it's an easy calculation. It's like eta to the minus a half. 1 plus a, so it's, go, it's, it's, it's big, but the u of t in h1, or even in hs, for s bigger than a half but smaller than 1, is like eta 1 half minus s, 1 plus b. So in particular, for s equals 1, you have 1 half minus 1 half, 1 plus b. Since b is bigger than a, you have some, some strong so if you look at the, 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 the quotient of these two quantities, it's very big. Okay. So this means you have transition to high frequencies, but this is for all t. So this transition to high frequencies is true, in fact, for all time after this time t plus. And you have saturation. The last line on the left. Yeah. It does not go. Yes, unfortunately, it does not go to zero. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's like this. It does not go to zero. We know it does not go to zero, and it's, it's a misery. We are, very, we are very unhappy. We would have liked to do this. But for the moment, we can't do this with this most simple model. Okay, and this is, in fact, the point. Of course, this is for the questions at the end of the talk. <laughs> Of course, but okay. So what we we tried it was really to understand what what's going on now. Okay, and the problem is why why is that complicated? Why is that complicated? Why is this construction complicated? So let me explain this now. Uh, So the method, the strategy of proof. Of course, you, you have to, to build. The main step is to build an approximate solution. Which starts with, uh, with this, uh, this expression I wrote, uh, I wrote here. No, where, where did I write it? I don't remember. Oh, yes, yes. U of tx equals sum of e to the i gamma j, etc. To find this. But if you plug this into the equation, you have very terrible nonlinear terms. Why? Because the, the main difficulty is uh, unlike, unlike, for instance, the, uh, the solitons in nonlinear Schrodinger, which are exponentially decaying. Uh, here you have something which is decaying like 1 over x, just 1 over x, a little bit like in your case. Okay, so we have to, to do this. But on the other hand, compared to the case uh, studied by Manuel, uh, we are in the Hamiltonian situation. So no maximal principle, no infinity estimates at them, etc. So, so we have to work with energy. Okay, and this makes strong different, which means that we are forced to build a much more precise approximate solution. I, I will tell you. Because if you plug, if you plug these two q beta together, of course you will have interaction terms. You will have the q beta square q beta. This is, this is uh, in fact, in, in the equation satisfied by q beta, no problem. But then you have interaction term between q beta 1 and q beta 2. 
of course, they are not centered at the same place. We expect that they are far enough. OK, we can cook them up so that. But even if they are far enough, the Q of these two Q beta is very, very slow. It's 1 over x. So you don't have integrability. So you have to go further. And in fact, you have to go much further in order to, to, have, a nice, uh, to have a nice energy estimate. And this is, in fact, what we do by writing an approximate solution of that kind. So essentially the same kind of, uh, sorry. The same kind of things, except that now I put a Vj, which depends on, again, the same parameters. Uh, sorry, I should not write it that way. Yes, sorry. X minus Xj of t, lambda of j of t, and uh, and uh, 1 minus beta g of t. And this will be, of course, also a, a function of x1 of t, x2 of t, you know, more, more tri non trivial function of all these parameters, okay? Beta 1, beta 2, etc. Gamma 1, gamma 2. So if you plug this into the equation. Again, okay. absolutely. Sorry. So if you look at this equation now, and you plug, of course the Vj will be, the first term of Bj will be Q beta J. Let me call these, param these parameters P of T, okay? And then, but then you need to go further. And you need in fact to go much further with iterative corrections. No, n, tjn of y. And these iterative corrections are given exactly as uh, in the WKB method or any kind of approximate method by linearized e equations, by just correction terms. So you linearize the equation on this q beta, and you have to solve the linearized equation iteratively by these guys. So you need to know a lot about the linearized operator, exactly as in the case of Atem, for instance. Okay, so, but the problem is that linearized operator is a little ugly, okay? The linearized operator is made with these Q beta J's, which is a self, uh, pseudo differential operator with, uh, with variable coefficients, Q beta square, et cetera, et cetera. So you have to do something with them. In particular, you want to see the instability space which corresponds to the kernel of this. So you have to identify the kernel. Now comes the miracle because we all want to go to lunch. So the miracle is that we are not that far from integrability. And for the integrability, the linearized operator for Q was studied by Anna. She did the work, okay? And because of integrability, you can study this linearized operator completely Precisely, you know exactly what is the kernel. It corresponds to the two fundamental, uh, two fundamental symmetries, which are translations and multiplication by modulus one, which correspond to the to uh, U L two and uh, and M of U, the momentum. And in, it turns out that by perturbation theory, you have the same properties for L beta. And then you have, of course, to to get very nice estimates on this L beta. It's a lot of work, and in fact. By doing this, you, you have, in, in, in that case, an ODE system on these parameters. And for this ODE system, where's my choke? For this ODE system, we can make a fairly precise analysis of the evolution, okay? So in particular, you have, uh, just to make, to give you a flavor, of, of the, the system, a very important part of this ODE system is the one on beta 2. Because beta 2 will be really the guy who is going to change in this story. So we have beta 2 dot of t divided by 1 minus beta 2 dot of t. So it's, it's a, of course, there are plenty of remainder terms in all that stuff. And this is something like two real parts 
of Q beta 2 of T, essentially, essentially something like this. I gamma 2 of T minus gamma 1 of T. Okay, something like this. Ooh, so, of course, remember that this guy was something like 1 over T times F of minus 1 beta 2 of T, 1 plus beta 2 of T. So here you have to make this two-scale analysis. And the idea is, in fact, to make a two-scale analysis with this new variable here. Okay. And if you, if you do this two-scale analysis with this new variable, you see essentially three regimes. And that will be my last board, not slide, but board. My last board. Essentially, we have three regimes. So this is time, t initial here, which is e to the minus, e to delta, z, uh, delta minus 1, okay, so very, already very big, t plus, which is e to the minus delta 0 minus 1, very big, and inside, and here you have some intermediate time, e to the delta 0 minus 1. So these are the three regimes. So regime 1, regime 2, Regime three. The first regime corresponds to a situation where, in fact, one minus beta two is very small, so that this function f here is essentially evaluated at zero. This means that q beta two is like one over t. But in that case, you are very close to the Zeger equation, and in fact, you have the Zeger regime. And during this regime, beta two will change drastically to go to something much closer to 1. Change. Not to, not to 1, but almost. 1 minus, OK? Then you have some intermediate regime, which is, in fact, the most difficult regime, because in that case, 1 minus beta 2 times t is between small and big, OK? So you, have really, you really have to, to, to scale in tau equals 1 minus beta 2 t. And, and to look at this new variable, and you find very nice uh, nonlinear ODEs which would describe this regime. And finally, you have the two soliton regime here, which, in fact, these solitons, okay, they are again solitary. Okay, so this means that they are too far away. One minus beta two times t then is bigger than some power, positive power of t. So this function here is integrable in time, so that you can integrate up to infinity, and this stabilizes everything. So that's why you don't have weak turbulence. You have something which is saturated after some time. Can you say that you make the two solitons approach each other in regime one, their interaction? Yeah, yeah, in some sense, the, the, yeah. Essentially this, yeah. Essentially this. That's exactly what happens. Okay? So I'm also always done, almost done. The, the only thing I wanted to say is, of course, I mean, how to go further. Okay? So how to go further, there are several questions. The first one, of course, is, is uh, connected to the remark by Walter, which, okay, since it works, and since we, we were really happy with this, why don't we do it again? Okay? So, <laughs> so that's exactly what we would like to do and, and find another soliton far away and you see, okay, come here and just try to interact with this one, etc., etc., and go to wave turbulence. That was my second <laughs> observation. It turns out that in the periodic case, in the periodic case, you, uh, Sandrine Grelier and myself studied the Sager equation. And in that case, we have much more wave turbulence, okay? So in the periodic case, we have much more wave turbulence, and we can see a transition to high frequencies corresponding to Sobolev norms, which are super polynomial in time, almost exponential in time. So of course, it's, it's, a, very, it's a very natural question to look at, at this, this modification to the half-wave equation, except that the q-beta have to be cut, cut off, etc. It's more, much more complicated, and we have to do something slightly different. 
but for sure we would like to do it. And finally, of course, in both cases, periodic or not periodic, the question, the important question is about the rate of transition to high frequencies. Is it polynomial? Is it super polynomial? Is it exponential? Is it like a log? For instance, there are some results by Annie Posader, Zvetkov, Vichilia. For cubic NLS, on the cylinder R times T2, where they prove some transition to high frequencies really up to infinity, but with a very, very slow rate. Uh, it's, it can be proved using uh, three cards inequalities that it, uh, it, this rate cannot be more than polynomial. So, you know, compared to the cubic segue equation on the circle, where we have super polynomials, so faster than any polynomial, there is still uh, a property, uh, a, a strong difference. And what they found here is something much smaller you, using a modified uh, scattering theory due to Toru Ozawa. Uh, they, 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 they have to change t into log t. So you have essentially something very, very logarithmic. Okay? So, but this is a very nice first step for, to wave turbulence too. Okay, so there are plenty of questions about this, but I think that what one of the advantages of this approach is that we have real nonlinear objects and we can work with them, we can make computations with them, and that's what we would like to do in the future. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.